I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and welcome to Esoterica, where we explore the arcane side of history, philosophy, and religion. In this video, celebrating a thousand subscribers, I want to reach out and say how much I appreciate everyone who subscribed, and especially the patrons of this channel. So just in a little bit of channel news, this summer I should be able to produce content just about every week on various topics in esotericism. One, in the fall, I'll go back to teaching full time, may slow down a little bit. So another thing that may slow down things a little bit in the month of August is that my partner and I are expecting our second kiddo, and so you can expect that the content for here at Esoterica will taper off a little bit in August, but I'm going to do my very best to continue producing content throughout the fall and on into the winter and beyond. So I just want to say thanks again to all my subscribers and patrons. Uh, your support means a great deal to me. In one of the earliest videos I uploaded to the channel, I was exploring CLM 849, sometimes referred to as the Munich Necromancer's Manual. And in that episode, I asked folks to reply in the comments if they'd be interested in seeing what goes into actually transcribing and editing and producing a medieval document from the actual manuscript to the printed form. So this episode is going to be just that. We're going to look very closely at one page, one folio, from the Munich Necromancer's Manual and show how difficult it is to read a medieval book and then transcribe that medieval book and produce a modern version of it. But before we do that, I want to announce a kind of raffle. I've actually recreated a complete page, the page we'll be looking at, from the Munich Necromancer's Manual here. Uh, this is actually done by hand by me. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but I'm a calligrapher and I've actually worked with medieval books uh, in the past. I got to work with some medieval manuscripts at the famed Bibliotheca Philosophica Hermetica, better known as the Rittmann Library in Amsterdam while I was working on my masters. So I actually have a great love of medieval books, of scribes, and of scripts. And what I've done is actually recreate an entire leaf or entire folio of the Munich Necromancer's Manual by hand. This is the original here. So you can see um, just how similar they are, uh, although mine's a little bit more calligraphic, if I may say so myself. So what I plan to do with this leaf is actually raffle this off to my patrons. So the idea here is if between now and the end of July of 2020, if you become a Patreon supporter of Esoterica, you'll enter into the raffle for this manuscript page. The higher the level of patronage you choose to adopt, the more likely you are to win the page here from the Munich Necromancer's Manual. And if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. So consider supporting Esoterica at Patreon, and if you do, you may stand a chance to win this manuscript. So let's say you and your friends are headed out to rural Michigan to camp in an old cabin. You arrive, and after hearing some strange noises in the basement, you go down to investigate. Because you're that guy. The guy that's going to get all your friends killed. It's okay to be that guy. Just know you're that guy. I know I'm that guy, so it's okay. Join the club. Okay, would-be Ash in the basement. You search around a bit, and there you see it. The Necronama something. If you were to find a real necromancer's manual, what would it look like? And what would be the process for actually reading it out loud, actually performing some of the magic held within the pages? Because you know you're, you're trying to get your friends killed, right? So if we're going to read a historical book of necromancy, what would actually be involved? Could you just open the book up, turn to chapter 10, How to Resurrect the Dead, and then read off the page how to do it? The short answer is probably not. So let's get cracking on how to understand an actual book of necromancy. Because I mean, ancient evil is not going to release itself, is it? So first and foremost, and in all seriousness, if you do find a medieval book anywhere, please take it to a conservationist. I mean, you should let a professional deal with horrifying ancient evil. Ancient artifacts, especially ancient books, can deteriorate rapidly without conservation. And further, these books are just very rare. CLM 849 is the one and only manuscript that we have of that text. And if it were destroyed, we'd lose all that information forever. So it's really imperative that if you find an ancient artifact, especially an ancient book, no matter how interesting or evil it might be, please take it to a conservationist 
you can contact a local art museum and they can put you in contact with someone that can help you ensure that the book is preserved. Okay, back to our imaginary situation. If you were to find a real life Necronomicon, what would it look like? Well, the best example of historical necromancer's manual actually dates from the mid 15th century and is held in Germany and it's known simply as CLM 849. Not nearly as romantic as Necronomicon, but it's still a book of necromancy. So we're gonna use that manuscript as a kind of exemplar. If you were to find a real medieval book of magic, it would look a lot like CLM 849. I'll include a link in the description below so you actually can leaf through the manuscript digitally online. So the first thing you would notice about the size of the manuscript is it's probably going to be much smaller than you expect. CLM 849 is only about 8 by 5 inches or 20 by 12 centimeters. Medieval books were simply very expensive and while massive tomes make for great Hollywood movies, the vast majority of medieval books were quite small. It's also worth noting that when you would open the book up, you would notice that several pages were probably missing. This is actually pretty typical of medieval books of magic, and it probably explains why the ones that have survived have in fact survived. So if you leaf through the book quickly, you'll notice that the pages are absolutely filled with very dense text, and there are curious diagrams throughout the manuscript itself. If you take a look at the binding, you'll notice that this book has actually been rebound at some point in the recent past. CLM 849 has been rebound sometime in the 19th or early 20th centuries, and this is a bit of a pity. And honestly, this is pretty typical. Many medieval books are bound and rebound several times throughout their lifetime. And this makes some sense. Um, you can think about the binding of a book like the armor. And over the course of hundreds of years, these books come in contact with all kinds of adverse conditions, whether it be fires or mishandling, or simply the changes in heat and humidity throughout the seasons. The leather and paper that make up the binding often deteriorates very rapidly, and over time, this binding has to be replaced. Now, I said that CLM 849 had been rebound in the 19th or early 20th century, and that's a bit of a pity. Often, the binding tells us a great deal about the provenance of the book. For instance, in order to build out the binding, many times older manuscripts are sort of packed into the binding, and it's from those older manuscripts that, one, we can recover manuscripts that have been lost, and two, we can learn more about the cultural and historical situation in which the book being bound is actually being produced. The most famous example of this, to my mind, is that inside of the binding of some of the Nag Hammadi library, there was actually a piece of papyrus with a date on it, and that gave us some indication about when these books were produced. So the fact that the book has been rebound since its original binding so it just might mean that we've lost some crucial information about the development of the manuscript. Further, you can learn all kinds of other things about the binding, and to be sure, I'm not an expert in book binding. Uh, book binding is its own subfield, and there are people who are experts just in book binding. So again, it just shows you the division of labor that goes into how complex these medieval books are. Although I will mention two interesting things about book binding. One is that you might actually find that your copy of the Necronomicon or whatever evil book you're imagining actually has chains attached to the cover. If one were to find a book with links of chains attached to the cover, you'll know that that book came from a chain library. A chain library is a library in which very rare books have been stored throughout the past and they've literally been chained to the shelves to prevent them from being stolen. One of the more famous examples of a chained book that I can think of is the massive tome that holds many of the works of the medieval Christian mystic Hildegard of Bingen. You can still see the chains attached to that manuscript. So if you find a book with chains attached, you'll know that it came from a chain library, which again gives some interesting provenance to the book. Secondly, it's also possible for books to be bound in all kinds of material, from wood to leather to thick pieces of paper. One rather interesting thing that one can bind a book in is, well, since we're on the topic of necromancy, human flesh. And there are about a dozen books in the world that have been confirmed to actually have been bound in human flesh. Now, none of these, to my knowledge, are books of necromancy or books of magic at all. And many books thought to have been bound in human flesh have actually been disproven as such. In fact, there's an entire project doing nothing but going from library to library, actually scientifically analyzing the binding of books that are claimed to have been bound in human flesh to test to see if they in fact are. Some books have been proven to be bound in human flesh, and some books have been found to not been bound in human flesh, despite the rumors that they were. I'll include a link in the description below if you want to check out that project. It's a bit macabre, but there is just something interesting about folks going out uh, and checking to see whether or not books are bound in human flesh as kind of their job.
So if you're interested in that rather macabre aspect of bookbinding, check out the link in the description below. So as you leaf through the book, you'll notice that it doesn't contain one script and one hand. We'll talk about the difference between scripts and hands in just a minute. But rather, what you have is seemingly different text composed in different scripts and in different hands, seemingly about different topics. This is pretty common for medieval books. Medieval books are often anthological, which just means that there are several different texts written by several different scribes gathered into one volume per the interest of the purchaser. So you might have, for instance, several different books on magic bound into one text, and that's exactly what we have here with CLM 849. We have several different texts concerning magic from different angles, seemingly written by different scribes, perhaps even over different years, perhaps even over a decade, bound together in a single volume. The Munich Necromancer's Manual actually occupies the first 108 folios of this volume, and it's that text we'll be focusing on in this episode. So let's begin introducing a couple of technical terms, and we'll introduce more technical paleographic terms as we go through analyzing this Munich Necromancer's Manual. So the first set of terms we'll need to look at are folio, recto, and verso. In a handwritten book, we talk about folios and whether those folios are recto or verso. So if we want to take a handwritten book and open it up and lay it flat, we would say that we're looking at two folios. The folio on the left is the verso folio, and the folio on the right is the recto folio, which tells you you're dealing with the eighth leaf, the eighth piece of parchment or paper, and you're dealing with the recto of that folio. So this is a slightly different mechanism for understanding pagination in a handwritten book, as opposed to the system of straight pagination we see in printed books. So finally, before turning to the text itself, we can talk a little bit about what this manuscript is actually written on. So in this case, it happens to be rag paper, probably made from linen, as opposed to parchment or vellum, which are made from animal skins. So from this, we can see that this book is probably much more utilitarian and was produced much more on the least expensive side of the spectrum, because at this time, paper was becoming cheaper, significantly cheaper than vellum. And while paper mills had already developed by the 12th century, by the mid 15th century, paper was widely available, though it was of significantly varying quality at this time. What's interesting about paper at this time is that paper actually sometimes contains watermarks that give us a clue about where the paper was actually produced. The manuscript I produced for the Patreon raffle, there's a watermark of the producer of the paper and the ship's anchor, which is their logo. There are great catalogs of watermarks that one can look through and actually determine where pieces of paper have come from historically. To my knowledge, CLM 849 does not contain any watermarks and therefore tracing the paper I don't think has been done if it can be done. So let's take a typical folio from CLM 849 as an exemplar for the Necromancer's Manual you found in that basement, and let's do the work of analyzing it in order to read it from the words on the page in Latin all the way to a standard English translation. So if we open CLM 849 to a typical page, here we're gonna be looking at the 28th folio, the recto of the 28th folio, um, we'll see this text is written in Latin. Um, that's not surprising. Most learned text in the Middle Ages would have been written in Latin. And if we look at this text a little closer, we'll learn that the Latin here is not terribly learned or terribly elegant for that matter. But it's the Latin typical of someone with some degree of education. Uh, if you're simply uneducated, you're going to have no access to Latin at all. Uh, what we have here is a text probably composed by a lower level of the clerical orders, uh, and this is sometimes associated with what is called the clerical necromantic underground. It's not surprising that some of the necromantic texts being composed here in the Middle Ages are going to be composed by clerics. After all, they're going to be the people with access to both the ritual knowledge and the Latin language and the philosophical knowledge in order to generate those kinds of texts. It's not surprising we may have something like priests by day, but necromancers by night. You'll notice that the text uh, generally lacks punctuation. That's pretty typical of Latin texts. Uh, Latin as a language is a case language, and if you write Latin and read Latin well enough, not only do you not really need punctuation, but you really don't even need uh, word breaks. Many early Latin texts uh, are in what is called textual continua, that is to say, 
Uh, they are just a long string of characters without any breaks uh, at all between words because the case system of the Latin language allows you to avoid uh, using those. By the time that we are now in the Middle Ages, uh, knowledge of Latin has dropped off significantly, and as knowledge of Latin uh, falls away and as uh, meaning becomes less clear, punctuation becomes something that becomes more and more and more needed. Uh, we'll see a couple of punctuation marks in this text as we continue, but not many. In fact, we just see one, I believe. Uh, you also notice that there are lots of uh, superlineal strokes over many of the words, which just means that there are these horizontal bars over many words here in the manuscript. Um, those are there to indicate abbreviations, as one of the things we'll see here as we get into the manuscript, that this is, like many manuscripts, uh, heavily abbreviated, which can present a significant challenge to the reader of a text like this. So this heavy abbreviation is going to add significantly to the overall difficulty of reading the text itself. On the page, we'll see that we have a single column of text. Uh, medieval manuscripts often have two columns of text, uh, and the reason why is that um, these two columns allow for a bit easier reading. Uh, the eye tends to get uh, lost a little less if you're reading over shorter uh, spans of, of text, and so having two columns actually prevents you from getting lost in the manuscript. Although I'll say that single column texts are not terribly unusual either, especially for things like student textbooks, and I'll talk more about student textbooks in just a minute. This manuscript reminds me heavily of the kind of text that you would see being produced in the university environment. So we're going to start our analysis of the text about five lines down with that very large uh, versal T, very likely in the color red. Uh, I'm working with a black and white reproduction of the manuscript, so I'm not quite sure, but it would be very typical for that, um, that versal T to be either in red or in blue, and my guess here is that it would be in red. Versals are uh, letters that are built up in what is called the Lombardic style. You can see this Lombardic style in some medieval manuscripts, and you also see it most famously on medieval coins. Uh, I'm also a medieval coin collector, and so learning to read Lombardic capitals is quintessentially part of how one does coin analysis in the Middle Ages as well. So we have this Lombardic uh, T that's being built up, which just means that it's built up of several strokes as opposed to the single stroke of letters. Uh, and again, it is painted in red or blue. If there were gold leaf applied to this manuscript, we would then call that manuscript an illuminated manuscript. Uh, illumination is the, the art of applying gold leaf to a manuscript. This manuscript is of relatively utilitarian value as opposed to being a deluxe manuscript, and so we're not going to find any gold leaf on this manuscript at all, so it is certainly not illuminated. Further, if we were to find little paintings, which are pretty typical in many nicer medieval manuscripts, those little paintings we refer to as miniatures. We don't find any miniatures in this manuscript. Again, miniatures would be the kind of things we would find in relatively deluxe manuscripts, as opposed to something like CLM 849, which is pretty rough and ready and very utilitarian. Also, this is not the kind of document you would take to a professional scribe to have them illuminate and paint, just insofar as this is probably a book that is straightforwardly illegal. So uh, taking a book like this to a professional illuminator or to a professional, or even to a professional scribe could have gotten you into significant amounts of trouble, in my opinion. As you might imagine, uh, paleography, the study of ancient writing, has its own technical vocabulary, and we're beginning to pick some of that up now. There are other letters on the page that appear to me to be rubricated. Rubricated just means that the letters have had some degree of red applied to them. This is typically used to introduce new chapters or new sentences. Sometimes a little bit of red paint is applied to important words or to important letters in order to indicate that something has changed in the manuscript. You can see that here, I think, on the second line with the word cum. It's there toward the end. That word cum starts the second sentence of the document. And I think that that, if I'm right, uh, is actually rubricated and it would tell us that uh, we're dealing with a new sentence. You may have also seen some Bibles that actually contain the words of Jesus in red. That is an actual example of rubrication that has persisted into printing 
Not just that, it's persisted actually all the way into modern editions of the King James Bible. So this tradition of rubrication can be found from medieval manuscripts all the way up till now. This text also contains a large diagram that dominates the last uh, half of the page or so. We typically call these large diagrams on a page or any diagram on a page a device in paleography. And we're gonna come back to this device here in just a little bit. The text itself is written in a script that paleographers refer to as textura quadrata, but that isn't quite true here. There's uh, something that makes it not quite uh, textura quadrata. Paleographers use the term script to refer to general styles of writing and the term hand to refer to the individual style of writing done by that particular scribe. If you really want to make a paleographer irate, refer to a script as a font and their blood will begin to boil inside their body. Uh, fonts refer to types used in printing, whereas for manuscripts, we use the term script to refer to general styles of handwriting. Like I said, this script is typically called textura quadrata, which literally means woven squares because of the dense appearance of this script on the page. Now I know sometimes this script is referred to as Gothic or black letter. I don't like to use the term Gothic. Um, this term Gothic was invented by humanists uh, in the 15th century, primarily to distance themselves from their forebears. There was an idea that the Middle Ages was backwards and darkness and ignorance and stupidity and barbarity. And they actually used the term of the main barbarians that they knew, the Goths, in order to mock previous culture. I don't like this idea of calling the text Gothic because the term Gothic was invented primarily to be a slur against medieval writers and medieval thought. And so I'm resistant to using the term Gothic because I think the term is primarily a political and an othering term as opposed to a term that actually analyzes the script at hand. Now I will say to the credit of the Italian humanists, their hands are very legible to modern eyes. So if you were to look at a Italian humanist hand of the mid 15th century, about the same time as we're looking at this text of CLM 849, that text would be a lot more legible to you. Despite that, the people that wrote this type of script actually called it literes moderna, modern letters. And given that it was used for centuries, in fact, it was used all the way into printing, all the way into uh, German printing into the 20th century, we can conclude that this script was relatively clear and easy to write to the people of the Middle Ages. So the idea that the text was inherently incomprehensible or illegible simply isn't true. This script lasted for hundreds of years. We can conclude that it was relatively easy to read and write for the people that read and wrote it. Though one can see why this text might get called black letter. The text does produce a very heavy appearance on the page. Although if one were to look at many medieval manuscripts, many of the inks are actually of a reddish or a brown appearance in the text. Now that's somewhat because of age, but it's often very rare to see a jet black uh, ink produced in the Middle Ages. And that's because this script is very densely written and when it is written in black ink can have a very striking appearance on the page. Now, as I said, this script is typically called by paleographers textura quadrata. Because this script is so hurried, there's a tendency toward it to become what paleographers will call formata rather than textura. There's a tendency of this hand to be more formata than textura. Think of scripts as existing on a kind of spectrum. When the letters don't touch at all, we typically refer to that as pure textura. When they touch a little bit, we refer to that as formata. And when they all touch and run together, we typically refer to that as corsiva or cursive. Uh, it actually comes from the Latin word meaning to run a race. And we see this text actually has some formata elements because the scribe is writing very, very quickly, it appears. So this individual hand, while it may be appealing to your eye, tends much more to the formata and therefore the utilitarian purposes rather than toward it being strictly quadrata and therefore perhaps more calligraphic in value. Further, and I mentioned this earlier, this hand tends to look to me a bit like the kinds of hands that one would see in a textbook of a period, perhaps giving us a further clue into the writer and user of this text. By this period, and we can talk about dating this manuscript in just a second, the literate layer of society has grown from the religious world, which would be priests and monks and nuns, 
to clerks, right? These are sort of bureaucrats that work in the official layer of the government. Notice the word here, clerk, and the word cleric share the same common root word. Uh, and at this point, we actually have entered into a wider secular audience. So by the mid 15th century, there is a much wider secular readership that these texts would have been available to. And one layer of that population would have been the clerk layer of medieval cities. I also suspect that the person who copied this text or who prepared this collection of texts was very likely the same person who was intending to use the magical incantations found within it. I say that because one doesn't exactly take a book of illicit magic to the local scriptoria to get copies. I think this would be something like taking a copy of the Anarchist Manifesto to your local Kinko's or FedEx to get them to run copies of how to make a bomb or something, God forbid. And so this text would probably have been composed by the exact same person that would have sought to have used it. And in my opinion, I see the hand of someone who looks very much like they would have had some experience copying books from the Pekia system. This is the way university textbooks were prepared. And to me, this text looks very much like the hand of a university student. So this is probably an undergrad or master's student um, working on their degree in theology or philosophy and then doing a little necromancy perhaps on the side. And as I mentioned, uh, the script can also help us date this along paleographic lines. As you probably imagine, scripts change a great deal through time and geographic region. For instance, if this text were written in Luxio minuscule, we would have a good idea that that script was produced in Burgundy sometime in the 7th and 8th centuries of France. Or if it were produced in a humanist style, we might conclude that it were produced in the 15th century, but probably towards northern Italy. Further, if we were, this text were to be written in something like insular minuscule, we could conclude that that text probably had its origins either on the islands of Britain and Ireland, or uh, it's possible also that Irish scribes who were very highly uh, sought after in the early Middle Ages also sometimes appear in France in the Carolingian court. So dating texts on paleographic lines is used from everything from the Dead Sea Scrolls to European and Asian manuscripts, and is generally considered reliable, if not somewhat scientific. On these grounds, this manuscript can be dated to roughly the mid 15th century and was likely produced in Germany, likely in the Munich area. So I think this text was produced pretty close to where it's actually been found. And I don't think this text traveled around a lot. And further, I don't think this text actually had much in the way of many owners. And I'll talk about more why I think about that in just a second. So if we just look at this leaf, we'll notice that there's not much in the way of marginalia. Uh, there is a number 28 written there in the upper right hand corner, although that has been written in a later hand. And there's a marginal note just below that number 28, and we'll come back to it in just a moment. Medieval books often have layers of notes and glosses. Sometimes these are running translations. Uh, they also have little uh, pointing hands at text to indicate something important called maniculae. Um, these often will point at text indicating something is important. They're sort of like underlining a text. You can often find doodles, corrections, uh, all kinds of addenda. There are all kinds of things that accumulate through time on the pages of medieval manuscripts. We have everything from uh, marks by authors telling you who owned it to telling you when it was sold. Uh, there are often numerous things that have accumulated onto the pages of medieval manuscript. What is interesting about CLM 849 is that it is surprisingly free of that kind of data which tells me, as I mentioned a moment ago, that this text hasn't passed through many hands. If it had passed through more hands, we would see more evidence, I think, of people writing in things in the margins, people taking notes, people putting in little pointing fingers, people doing all kinds of things as this text passed from author to author. So I don't think this text has passed through many hands, and I really don't think this text was actually very much known outside of the circle of the few people that owned it. I say that because there are very few mentions of this text. For instance, in the monumental Lynn Thorndike History of Magic and Experimental Science, which well documents the overwhelming majority of extant magical manuscripts, even manuscripts in the collection of the CLM, for whatever reason, this text is passed over. Uh, Lynn Thorndike does not mention this text anywhere in his enormous eight volume analysis of medieval magical manuscripts which just tells me that this was a relatively minor manuscript and was not terribly well known in its time. All right, let's start reading here on folio 28 recto. So the main difficulty here, aside from the hand itself, are going to be the abbreviations. 
Now, thankfully, Latin is pretty regular, so the abbreviations aren't too difficult to parse out. So we start here with our versal T. We have a short prefatory remark. We read, quote, tracto etiam, that's our first abbreviation. Notice the superlinear mark there to indicate that abbreviation. De arte, notice that the A here is slightly majuscule. That is to say, it rises above that center line. Invisibilitatis, with a dash over the I, probably to help prevent a misreading. Notice here that the I is actually dotted. That process is just beginning toward the end of the Middle Ages, and the dotting of I's is very inconsistent. Uh, in some scripts, uh, it's not uncommon, in fact, to double dot your Y's. We also have a long S, which uh, this scribe uses pretty inconsistently. These typically occur at the beginning and the ends of words and was developed as a space-saving scribal technique and grew out of the archaic Roman cursive. And if you think this manuscript is difficult to read, try reading Roman cursive. So at the end of the line, we have H-O, ho. There's a break on the syllable here at the end of the line. There's a break here on the syllable at the end of the line. This uh, allows you to really pack script all the way to the end of the line. And we pick up on the next line, DA, so ho DA, the word for today. So DA on the second line, quasi ab omnibus. You'll notice here, this is a heavily abbreviated word, omnibus. And then it says ignorata, which is uh, relatively clearly written out. The heavily abbreviated version of omnibus is pretty common on relatively common words. So for instance, you might see a word like dominus, lord, uh, that's actually just DMS with a line over it. So dominus is a very common word in medieval Latin, the word for lord, and it is often heavily abbreviated as well. All right, so we've read our first line. So let's go back up to our margin and we can look at that marginalia that I mentioned earlier. It reads, De Invisibilitate, right? De Invisibilitate. There is a nice uh, ligatured de. Ligatures are just when you combine several letters into one. So what we have in the marginalia is just a note telling us uh, what this section is gonna be about. And so this, so this spell, or experimenta, as the text typically call them, is, quote, on invisibility, right? De Invisibilitate there in our nice ablative. And so the text tells us we're going to be dealing with a spell on invisibility. So invisibility spells go back a millennia. You can think back to Plato and the Ring of Gyges, uh, but also spells for invisibility certainly go back as far as the Greek magical papyri. And I would say that after erotic binding spells, which are sometimes referred to as love spells, they are among the top five. And certainly I would say that after erotic binding spells, sometimes called love spells, that invisibility spells are probably in the top five of magical spells that we find in history, along with spells for things like finding treasure and divination, because who doesn't want to know the future and who doesn't want to find treasure? Also, just a note on how I tend to pronounce Latin. Uh, I tend toward a bit of a classical pronunciation, but will often voice my V's for clarity. As you may know, in classical Latin, the V's were unvoiced, right? So Caesar said, weeny, weedy, weeky. And I don't tend to uh, italicize my Latin in a very church Latin kind of way. So Latin is a mostly dead language. Uh, and I know that people get really passionate about the quote unquote correct way of pronouncing Latin. So I have my own idiosyncrasies in the ways that I pronounce Latin. So don't roast me too hard in the comments. All right, back to the manuscript. So we have after that first sentence, uh, and I'll do a translation of the whole thing once we get to the end. So after that first sentence or that first introductory clause, we have what looks to be a rubricated majuscule C, uh, and that tells us that we have come to either another sentence or another subsection. So we read thus, cum itaque, notice there is a pretty common abbreviation with the UE there, volueris apud omnia tam racionabilia, notice this one is quite difficult to read. There is then a very heavily litigered quam non invisibiliis, so we're on the next line now, ac sensibiliis haberi. Uh, and then there is a little dot there in the middle of the line. This little dot is called a punctus. Uh, puncti do the work of uh, periods and commas, sometimes semicolons in medieval punctuation. Uh, there is also, if you're curious, uh, two other forms of the punctus. There is the punctus elevatus, which typically does the work of a semicolon. And there is the punctus interrogativus, which also does, well, you guessed it, the work of the question mark and in fact becomes our modern question mark. So following the punctus, we read prino, 
Um, notice the litigator here of pri. Uh, I think there's also a misspelling here given the prima just below this one. Crescente luna di mercii. Notice that there is a long I there at the end of mercurii. Uh, that long I is on its way to becoming the modern J. We continue. In prima hora die castus ante per triduum et tonsus cobilus et barbum et albo indutus extra willem in loco occulto serino celo in pleno solo cum inse splendidissimo fac circulum ut hic apparit scribendo hec nomina cum eis omnia ibidum apparincia. Then after that line cum eis omnia ibidum apparincia there appears the device, that is to say, the large diagram that dominates the second half of the page. So let's take a look at the Latin text as a whole. I've included all of the abbreviations there inside of the brackets. Uh, the slash marks indicate the end of a line. I've included the one piece of punctuation we have, the punctus there on the third line. And we get a sense from just looking at this about how difficult this text is, in fact, to parse out and read. As you can see, the text is heavily abbreviated although the grammar is pretty typically medieval Latin. There's nothing uh, unusual about the grammar here. Notice that most of the abbreviations here are either one, pretty common words that anyone would expect reading medieval Latin, and notice also that case endings are doing a lot of the work of helping the reader despite the fact that this text is so heavily abbreviated. So in some sense, the abbreviations do make the text more challenging to read, but if you learn the ropes, and even as we've been reading this text very briefly, we can see that the abbreviations are pretty typical, right? So we have accusative endings that we would expect, we have genitive endings we expect, and those endings that we expect there in the various cases are the ones that are gonna get abbreviated. So what this does is that if you read Latin relatively well, it's going to allow you the ability to heavily abbreviate your text and therefore save a lot on real estate on the actual folio itself. So we're gonna turn in a moment to translate this text, but first I want to take a look at this device dominating the lower half of the page. So what we have is a circle, likely mechanically produced, that is to say it's not free drawn. I'm fairly confident that the scribe here has done this with a compass and that there are three figures inside of this device along with some various words. So what we have here along the outer edges are the uh, directions. We have Oriens, our east at the top. We have Okidens, our west at the bottom, and Meridies, south at the bottom. At the center, we have the word Magister, uh, which is uh, master, or mage, or teacher. So we have the Magist standing here in the middle where it is marked Magister. There is a sword drawn here with the tip facing toward the west and the hilt facing toward the east. And flanking the sword are two magical sigils with demonic names nearby. These are reading clockwise, Taraor, Bereth, Melamil, and Firiel there at the tip of the sword. And these sigils are pretty typical of the period with uh, little ringlets at some of the terminators, although this one is interesting with a sort of flag-shaped terminators uh, on the one to the left. Now I've done, I've done a separate video examining the history of these kinds of symbols or sigils, so if you're interested in that, please look at the card here at the top of the page. Uh, further, these demonic names do occur in various places uh, throughout the manuscript, although in slightly different spellings. Orthographic regularity at this time period is just something we really can't expect, so the names of demons or words in vernacular languages are going to have enormous variations in terms of orthography. And these demonic names actually pose a special kind of reading problem when we are transcribing this text. Unlike reading Latin, which is relatively regular, these demonic names occur only a few times in the text and sometimes only once. That would make them what is called a hapax legemenon. Uh, but because they're so poorly attested and because the letter forms in this script often resemble each other, it becomes really easy to misread the names of these demons. So for instance, notice how the R's of this manuscript vary somewhat in shape. Notice how in the name of the demon Taraor there on the left, they appear shaped uh, in a more regular way and they appear shaped in a way that looks to us a great deal like a modern R. If you look at the demonic name there at the tip of the sword, Firiel, one could easily misread this as Fiviel if you weren't accustomed to looking at the hand of this particular scribe and knowing that the R shape can sometimes appear a bit like a V. What we would also know if you're working with manuscripts at this time is that U's and V's are almost always doing double duty. They're almost always the exact same glyph. 
And so when we look at U's and V's, they look very similar, and therefore an individual V-shaped or a modern V-shaped glyph in a Latin text is going to be pretty unusual. So that we could know that we should read it as Firiel and not Fiviel. Also, because Firiel is a relatively unknown or minor angel slash demon, unlike, say, someone like Gabriel or even Uriel, misreadings of these names are rather possible. In fact, I don't know of another place where the angel Firiel appears, aside from maybe one other manuscript where this angel or demon is actually invoked in a love magic spell. Although it's conspicuous that right next to that uh, erotic binding spell, there is a spell for invisibility right afterwards. So um, it's possible that this angel or demon Firiel was originally bound up in invisibility magic, uh, but gets imported in that other manuscript into doing some erotic binding magic or love magic. Although just to be clear, uh, and if you read a text like the Lesser Key of Solomon, one of the things you'll notice is that the way that these angels and these demons get represented and the way their names get spelled and the way that they appear in various manuscripts varies enormously from manuscript to manuscript. And in the case of CLM 849, they actually even vary internally within the manuscript itself. So for me, this casts a bit of a pale over the magical efficacy of a manuscript like this, where often the ability to know the exact name of a demon is very important for controlling them in most theories of magic. And because these demonic names uh, range in so much degree in their orthography, one can wonder the degree to which, well, this magic or this, this invisibility spell would have been efficacious. So let's go back and let's do a little brief translation of the section that we've worked on. So welcome back. We've done a lot of work analyzing and transcribing this manuscript. So let's hazard a translation. And I hope you like dependent clauses. So it reads here in my somewhat mechanical translation, quote, here I treat the art of invisibility, which is unknown to everyone today. If you want to become invisible and insensible to all kinds of beings, both rational and not, then first, under a waxing moon on a Wednesday, in the first hour of the day, having been chased for three days prior, and with trimmed hair and beard, garbed in white, outside of town, and in a secret place, under a calm, clear sky, and on flat ground, inscribe the circle that appears here with a most splendid sword, writing these names along with everything else that appears here. Now, I'm translating this a little bit out of context of the text and somewhat mechanically, as I noted. If one were to do a proper translation, you'd probably want to harmonize the overall style and try to render the text perhaps less literally, maybe breaking up all those dependent clauses into separate sentences. But there we have it, a few lines, two sentences in fact, of an actual historical book of necromancy from the Latin manuscript all the way to, to a somewhat readable translation. So now I hope you have some idea about just how difficult reading a text like this is or would be. One must learn to read a variety of medieval scripts, then accustom oneself to the specifics of a single idiosyncratic hand, and then grapple with the very uneven medieval Latin, which itself is very heavily abbreviated. And all of this again is writing about topics that are themselves esoteric, and this is all without any attempt by the author to actually encode or further hide their ideas, which could be expected considering this kind of magic was completely illicit at the time of the composition of this book. So we're also even lucky to say that this text isn't even encoded in some way. But nevertheless, I think you can admit this is all quite a challenge. If you're curious, the text goes on to describe the rest of the spell for becoming invisible. Interestingly enough, it actually involves an invisibility cloak. So what the text describes is a series of fumigations that one must do, and then a further set of conjurations which cause those demons in, mentioned in the magic circle to appear. If you've done everything correctly on the correct day, then those spirits subsequently appear and they offer you an invisibility cloak. Now what you have to do is trade the white cloak that you're wearing for the invisibility cloak. So one has to come back several days later and the white cloak that you've traded for the invisibility cloak will appear back in the circle. And you have to burn that white cloak, which if you've done everything correctly, will cause the, I think, demons in this situation to wail and moan in uh, agony and sorrow. So you burn the original white cloak and you sprinkle the ashes of that cloak into the air with a further final conjuration 
and that will allow you to use the invisibility cloak to, well, render you invisible to all things rational and not. And then you'll be left with the cloak that allows you to become invisible to all things rational and not. Also, just so you should know, if you don't come back several days later and do the work of burning the white cloak, the demons will actually come and kill you within a week. So you should, you should probably do that. But that shouldn't be terribly surprising. I mean, you've just made a pact with a bunch of demons to give you an invisibility cloak. You should know that there's some kind of trick involved. If you're curious, this is actually one of three invisibility spells in CLM 849. Although what is unique about this one is that this invisibility spell doesn't require you to engage in any animal sacrifice. So this one's really good for vegetarian and vegan necromancers. So if you're interested in the Munich Necromancer's Manual, you can read a fantastic analysis of that text, along with the entire Latin text if you read some Latin, and a translation of a great deal of the text in Richard Kiekeffer's Forbidden Rites, a Necromancer's Manual of the 15th century. It's an absolutely fantastic work of scholarship, and I would certainly recommend checking it out if you're interested in historical books of necromancy. I'll include a link to that book in the description, so make sure to check that out. And as I mentioned earlier, I've done a general analysis of CLM 849, covering a wide range of the spells in the text. And so if you check out the card above, so make sure to check out that episode as well. Well, I hope this close analysis of a medieval book has given you some insight into the challenges faced by scholars, and I guess necromancers, in trying to read, translate, and analyze a text like this. If you're interested in books of magic, make sure to stay tuned. Here at Esoterica, we have an ongoing series on books of magic where we explore everything from the Greek magical papyri all the way up to modern books of contemporary magic. So make sure to subscribe and consider us supporting Esoterica on Patreon. And remember, if you do sign up for Patreon between now and the end of July, you stand a chance to win a reproduction of the very text we've been looking at here in CLM 849, handwritten by me on a Amalfi paper, some of, I think, the world's finest paper. Uh, make sure to sign up for Patreon if you are able to, and you will stand a chance here to win this reproduction of the invisibility spell, along with the magic circle here at the bottom uh, of CLM 849 in my own hand. Until next time, I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and you've been watching Esoterica, where we explore the arcane side of history, philosophy, and religion.